everybody, and welcome to Mission Control, a podcast focusing on executive directors and nonprofit leaders and how they strive to make positive impacts in their community. I'm your host, Paul Schmidt, owner and creative video strategist for Introduce Multimedia, and I'd like to welcome somebody who's been on this show before. <laughs> welcome her back, and that is Cindy Kangas, who is currently the executive director of the Capital Area Manufacturing Council. Welcome back to the show Hello. from a from a different standpoint, Cindy. This is yes. awesome. Yes, don't grill me too hard. <laughs> <laughs> I won't. I won't. I won't. I promise I won't do that. Maybe I don't know. So okay, but um, this is really cool. Uh, yeah, Cindy just took on a new position, not newer, not the newest, but the new a newer position. So let's just start with that. How I'm starting these yeah. podcasts now is telling me right off the bat, what is the mission of your organization? So the Capital Area Manufacturing Council is a membership association that champions activities that create an environment to build upon in Michigan's manufacturing competitiveness. So, you know, we advocate for all kinds of things, mainly manufacturing in the community, but also for the talent pipeline. You know, those youngsters that are coming up and they're making decisions about, um, you know, life choices, what they want to do for careers. And we're really trying to change the narrative so that um, more people are understanding what manufacturing is and selecting it as um, a career choice. I think it's very interesting because I've known you for quite a while and I've known you as being in the nonprofit world, in fact, your first position, I think I remember meeting you at, was Junior Achievement. Right. Um, um, so, the, and then you went on to, I'm not going to do your whole LinkedIn profile right here verbally. Right. But, right. But, so, but the difference being in the nonprofit now versus the nonprofits you were in before, it's completely different industry, completely different subset that I, I was like, Wow, I wonder, this is interesting. It's so, different in many ways, yeah. but in good ways. Yes. It's, it's been amazing. <laughs> well, how did you find this this uh, this organization, and what interested you in taking th this role? Um, the position was brought to me, and I'm a firm believer that if you have a strong network and you're working hard, people take notice. And so um, a friend of mine came to me with an opportunity and I thought, wow, you know, as you were saying, this is manufacturing. This isn't um, the traditional nonprofit role that I've played before. And how is, how am I going to make the jump? How is it going to be a fit for me? But again, growing up in Lansing, um, you know, most of my family members worked for GM or, you know, tier one, tier two organizations. Um, if you really appreciate Lansing, you understand that a majority of us are, are blue collar workers and we're out there um, hustling to make the community happen. And manufacturing is a huge part of that. So I already had kind of an appreciation for what it was. And I knew about being, you know, in a family member of, of ma a manufacturer but I didn't quite understand um, how broad manufacturing was. And I didn't understand um, a lot about the challenges in the industry. So this is month nine for me. And I can't even tell you, it is amazing. I am, I am someone, I'm a very hungry human being. I thrive on learning and being challenged and people coaching, teaching and mentoring me. And every time I visit one of our manufacturers that's a part of our council, I'm learning something very new. I'm learning um, about their challenges, but I'm also developing this greater sense of pride living here because there are so many things. I, I like to say manufacturing is the best kept secret that shouldn't be a secret. There are so many manufacturers here in our community that have nothing to do with the auto industry. And they're probably in your backyard. There's no sign on the door, but they're, you know, million dollar industries, billion dollar industries shipping globally. And they have this sense of pride. And the great thing about these places is the, 
the um, CEOs and the people that are running these factories, they're the ones giving me a tour. And they'll walk around with me and they know everyone by name. How many large companies can you visit where the CEO can walk out of their office and they know every single employee by name and they can talk to them about the job that they're doing? I have, I have never been so impressed. And I, I really feel this great passion about changing the narrative for the next generation of kids and skilled trades you know, working with local schools and local ISDs and teaching them that they can have these careers that aren't, you know, the dirty, um, you know, persona that we've heard from grandparents passed down. You know, I think right now we're pushing kids into four-year degrees and, you know, they get out of college and they start working at a coffee shop. Not always, but sometimes. And then, um, there are these certificate programs or you can get an apprenticeship and they'll pay for school. I mean, manufacturing is a viable option and there are amazing careers and it's just, uh, I feel like I found my calling. It's been an amazing <laughs> journey and I'm only nine months into it and I've seen change. They've given, I have an amazing board that's allowed me to um, start some new programs that I'm really proud of. It's just, I, I can't say enough. It's great. Well, coming into it, like you said, this is your your ninth month. And when you, on day one, what did you think you needed to start with? How did you start? Um, well, I did a little bit of training with my predecessor. And so it was clear that um, we have five counties under our umbrella. Ingham, Eaton, Clinton, Livingston, and Shiawassee. And it was clear that a majority of our members were within, you know, the Ingham County area. So I knew right away that there was a huge potential for growth as far as membership and advocacy. And, and that was where I started. But I also, it was very important to me to find mentors. So I reached out to other manufacturing groups across the state and I learned what they did in their first 90 days, their first year in, in their positions. And I realized I need to go visit the people that are our members. I need to form relationships and understand who they are, understand what they're building and understand what their struggles are. And even since I've started, the challenges have evolved. You know, it went from first the, the concern about staffing to the concern about you know um, employees needing the COVID vaccine. Now we're seeing a lot of supply chain issues. We're seeing a lot of people um, you know that are trying to onboard and they need to train their staff to be managers now that maybe weren't managers before. There's just there's so there's just this, this depth of of problems and issues that they're they're working on that I need to I needed to learn about. So that I could properly advocate. And when you said that uh, that there was a broad range to the mm -hmm. manufacturing world, uh, could you describe that a little bit? What what do you exactly yeah. do you mean? <laughs> well, I think again, being from Lansing, if you grew up here, you're just you, General Motors was it. But I think a lot of people don't understand those. First of all, those are assembly plants. And so a lot of the parts and pieces come from tier two, tier tier one, tier two suppliers, that sort of thing. I would say probably a thousand people touch the parts of your car before you actually sit down in it. But that's just a small part of manufacturing. When you think about um, steel and molding and, you know, it's, it's so broad. And you even think about like the biotech industry that we've got that's very strong here it's it's just it's broad we're all manufacturing really is just us put, building something putting something together for the greater good and shipping it you know globally sometimes and it's just they all face the same challenges but they just vary a little bit in in what they're doing and how they're doing it were you intimidated you know, I thought it was going to be a little scarier because um, 
the ratio of men to women is is minuscule. It's minuscule. And I would walk through some of these facilities and I'd see these little 100 pound girls, you know, hauling ass just like their male counterparts. And it was impressive to me. And one of the first things I did was start a women in manufacturing um, group. We meet quarterly. We, we network and we have um, special events and, and factory tours and that sort of thing. But I thought that there would be a lot, it would be a lot harder for me to prove myself and to prove that I was worthy of being there. But it's been the opposite. I feel as though um, no matter where I go, again, the culture is that they, they've just kind of wrapped their arms around me and said, come on. We're just going to coach, teach, and mentor you, just like they would a staff member. So it's, it, you know, here I am thinking I'm going to be at a board meeting, and there's it's going to be full of men that are trying to ask me and, and say, you know, do you know what you're talking about? And are you going to be able to prove yourself? And instead, they're like, we're just going to teach you. We're going to tell you everything you know. We know, and we're going to we're going to show you why we have so much pride in the manufacturing industry. I have not had any issues with that at all. As a matter of fact, I, I want to see there be more women and advocate for more women just in STEM period. But it hasn't, it was near, it wasn't nearly what I thought it would be at all. You know, and this is coming from a nonprofit world where a majority of nonprofits are run by and staffed by women. <laughs> it's been nice. It's been great. So what what do you think is the overarching uh, need that these because obviously they're come they're they're welcoming you in to tell you something. What are they telling yes. you? Um, you know, they're telling me their struggles, which of course it, a, a majority of them are um, worried about. Industry 4.0 and the new robotics and the new technologies and electric vehicles and things like that that are coming down the line. They're worried about staffing. They're always worried about staffing. Where what's going to happen when you know a majority of our welders and the average age welder is 55, they retire. What's going to happen if there's no longer skilled trades? Um, you know, and then supply chain has been huge. All of these people have things that they need to get places across the country, across the globe, on boats, on planes, in trucks. And, you know, there's a trucker shortage and there are ships out in the ocean. And so it's been interesting to hear um, what their needs are. But I have to say in saying that our talks aren't always just about what their needs are, because they're also very concerned about paying it forward and teaching the community and teaching the next generation of students about manufacturing so that um, it can continue. And it's, I, it, they have the biggest hearts. They just want to go into classrooms and talk to kids and be mentors. And it's been amazing to see. That, that is amazing. That is so taking what you know or knew or, developed over your your time in these other organizations um what are you bringing to the table for them what are what are you pinpointing yeah. as the skill set that you you have to help them with with these things that you're they're telling you um they're concerned about yeah so i don't know that it's a secret that i'm a social human being i'm powered by um being around humans <laughs> So I think that was part of what they, I mean, they wanted someone um, that was a strong leader that could um, obviously, I don't want to say massage, but build relationships that, that could make sure that all of our members are feeling heard and that I would be able to go out and um, talk to potential new members and tell them what the benefits of membership are. They were also looking for someone that could plan um, special events, which, you know, I've done quite a bit. And I think coming from a nonprofit background, you also have, you, you're forced to wear a lot of hats. You're forced to do a lot of jobs and learn a lot of things. And you're very conscious of your budget. 
So, you know, where someone off the street might come in and say, we need to spend this much money on this or this or this, I might say, well, let's ask somebody if they'll notate that or, you know, do we really need that? Or are there other ways to do it? So I, I feel like just having that thinking outside of the box, how can we make this happen? How can we do it the most efficiently? And then that social aspect of just um, thriving on networking has been a great, I think, uh, source of help to what they needed. Now, you just talked about being budget conscious and and having that. You are the only staff member. Yeah, I am. How are you? One man band. Well, and then then my question is, how are you budgeting your time to be able to do all the things here and, and get the communication out and be able to, to put the stuff together for the board? How are you able to do that? I mean, that's a lot of stuff for one person. I, it's true. I think if, if you know me or if you've ever worked with me, <laughs> that I work at a fast and furious pace because I, I like to get stuff done. And um, – there are times when I'm working, you know, 10 hours a day. And then there are times where I have, you know, shorter hours in the day. But I think like any new business owner that's maybe starting off on their own. And Paul, you started your own business at one time and you were putting in lots of hours. People understand that as you're putting together an organization, you have to put in the hours and you have to put in the foundation and then it will start to thrive. So. It wasn't like what I was doing was um, painstakingly hard, but you're right. It was taking a lot of time and I opted not to have um, a physical office working from home um, just to do the business side of the job has been fine for me. And to be honest, if I'm doing my job properly, I should be out touring factories on a daily basis. I shouldn't be sitting still. I should be off my butt and inside someone's facility. So it's just, you know, there are times when it's hard to turn it off. When you work from home, we all have that, oh, my laptop's sitting there. Do I need to open it up and look at my email? But on the flip side of that, I can see the progress and I know we're getting to a place where it's like, oh, okay. You know, things are running smoothly. I got this. You know, I, 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 it's never been, how can I say this? If you do what you love and you're enjoying your job, it's not like work. You know what I'm saying? Like, I feel like I could go on a tour in a factory and sit there all day long and watch people push buttons and say, what are you doing? Can I push that? What does this do? What does this do? It's not, it's not work to me. It's, it's a joy being a part of it. And so, yeah, there are days where there, you know, I'm doing invoices or I'm doing something to help with the budget or whatever, you know, the newsletter here at my home, but you know, most of the time I'm out being social and that's my jam, Paul. I love it. Doesn't matter. Well, what over the past nine months, you know, yes. going going to all the places that you went to, meeting all the folks that you met and and uh, you know, just acclimating yourself to the nuances of this new organization, what was the biggest surprise that jumped out at you and you're like Wow, I did not expect that. You know what? Um, I mean, I've learned a lot in the manufacturing industry. Mm-hmm. I've learned a lot about what's happening here. But what what really struck me was how ignorant I am and how ignorant we all have been about manufacturing in the area because we've all kind of just associated it with General Motors and not realized what was going on here. And coming from a nonprofit background where I was, primarily doing fundraising, I kind of made it my job to um, reach out to local organizations to see if they could provide volunteers for a certain project or if they wanted to sponsor a special event. And none of these organizations were ever on my radar, ever. And and that, that doesn't diminish them. They're just kind of these hidden gems and they're doing their own things in the community. It's not all, It's also not to say that they're not community partners because they are. It just, um, I feel as though, again, they're kind of this little secret that not a lot of people know about. And we all should be very proud of these people in our backyard. They're doing amazing things. And uh, the economy, like if you look through COVID 
And all of these businesses that have been struck hard during COVID, manufacturing continues to grow and thrive. And manufacturing is going to take us through this next decade as things evolve. We can't have a United States without manufacturing right here in our backyard. Mm -hmm. It's so important. And there's so many great people doing these jobs. I just, I, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say that I was just kind of ignorant. I didn't realize how large the community was and how amazing they were. Now talk a little bit, you, we, you mentioned a little bit ago about talking to the school systems and mm. such about their manufacturing programs or their apprenticeship programs going into different areas. Talk yeah. about how you want to cultivate that or what kind of inroads that you're making there, because I think that's an important um, aspect of, of what you do, um, what you can oh. do. I could talk about this all day, Paul. <laughs> so every oh, how about for the next five to seven minutes? How about that? <laughs> well, the first Friday of every October, I'll start with that is Manufacturing Day, and traditionally, um, children or students from the local ISDs, the local high schools, some middle school kids would get on a bus and tour multiple factories, and then go back and talk about what they learned, and. That's wonderful. It's a one day blast of manufacturing, but we realize it's not enough. We need to really change the narrative because we, there are influencers like counselors, teachers, and parents that aren't talking to their kids about manufacturing jobs just because they don't know them or what they know about them may be incorrect. So we need to get into the schools. We need to get into the ISDs and spend more time mentoring, coaching, teaching, and mentoring not just the students, but, you know, the staff about the jobs that are open for the kids. And then um, I'm really proud because we're starting a mentorship at Sexton High School. And again, growing up in Lansing, I have a passion for Lansing schools. And we all know that their attendance is dwindling and the students there really need some loving. And the, I met with a superintendent. And his goal was to have um, one mentor for every student in the district. And I, when I sat down, I was thinking, wow, I wish I had enough bodies that I could do that. But I'll tell you what, we'll adopt, we'll, we'll take on one of your high schools. So um, Sexton was the best um, match for us because they already have um, some manufacturing built into some of their curriculum. So now I have two manufacturers visiting Sexton High School four times a month through the end of this year. And my hope is that in the fall, it will just continue to grow. And not just at Sexton, at all the Lansing schools and at all of the area surrounding schools so that we can tell people, tell kids, you know, about what these jobs are, that it's not just you sitting there and assembling things. There are so many aspects, technology aspects and, and science-based aspects of these jobs that you might not even have, have considered. So we're working on it. But the narrative needs to change, Paul, and we are going to make that happen, no doubt. I think that's incredible. I think apprenticeship programs are underutilized immensely with schools, with community colleges, with all the secondary education that can happen. I, yeah. I'm really a proponent for that type of situation to be more stronger in, in multiple industries. So I, I really... I really uh, um, am very glad that you're you're taking that focus. I, I, th yeah. I think it's necessary. Now, another th aspect to the capital area of manufacturing council is that, like you mentioned at the top of this podcast, is that it is a membership-based organization. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I've come across in my many travels, many or uh, many orgs I'm involved with. When it comes to the membership aspect, that's that's sometimes a tough sell. So, you know, you know, keeping members. What what are what are some of the key aspects that you are trying to do um, from your standpoint to try to make sure that you retain these members? Um, what are they? You, we already talked about 
what they're worried about, but what are they looking for as being part of this this organization? Yes, all memberships need to be value based, right? So, what is the value that they're getting out of their membership? Um, you know, part of it is that net um, manufacturers like to learn from each other and network with each other. So, um, you know, one of the first points of sale, I guess you would say, is that you know we've got all these other manufacturers here. You know, and they're going through some of the same things that you're going through. And wouldn't it be great if you had these five people on your speed dial that you could call if you were having some sort of issue? So networking is number one. We have a lot of learning opportunities. We have a lot of guest speakers. We do a lot of special events, sometimes two a month. And one of those is usually a factory tour. So the manufacturers get together and they'll go to another factory and we'll all tour that together. Um, we have a wage and compensation survey, which comes out and, you know, the war on talent is, is going strong. And so when we take numbers from the state of Michigan and we take numbers from Michigan State University and we send our um, manufacturers a survey, we're asking them, you know, what are you paying your entry level employees? What are your second and third shift premiums? What benefits are you offering your staff? And then, you know, we put all that information together into a booklet and we give it to these manufacturers and they've got this, this great little magazine that shows them how competitive they are in the hiring process. Because of course, you know, if they're paying their entry level employees 20 bucks an hour, but somebody down the street's paying 22 bucks an hour, you know, it's, it's helpful to know that. And if you're offering, you know, two weeks vacation and somebody's offering three weeks vacation and a pony. Well, <laughs> you know, get that pony. Pony. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think, you know, all of these things are a benefit, but that doesn't mean we don't have room to grow. We are putting together a new strategic um, plan where we're looking at the next five years. And, and I think that there will be more as we look ahead, more trainings together that we're doing. Um, we've talked a lot about, um, DEI training and and um, bringing in a guest speakers, not just local guest speakers, but national guest speakers. We just had our all member meeting where we had um, a national speaker come talk to us about supply chain, and it was enlightening. Everyone was so excited to hear the perspective of what's going on on a national level as opposed to just hearing what's happening nearby. So, you know, there's there's a lot going on, but I think that you'll find that not a lot of people in Lansing, Paul, maybe you can vouch for this, as you're going to networking events, you don't really see a lot of manufacturers there. Manufacturers see their business as being maybe overseas or in other states. And sometimes they are at those events. You know, sometimes they're at luncheons and things. But I think what we offer is the chance for you to get together in a room and get together at special events with people that are going through the exact same thing that you are. And maybe there's a chance that you can do business together. Maybe there's a chance that you can share resources. If nothing else, there's a sense of pride. This is our area. We're, gonna, we're, we're strong and we're together. That's great. So, yeah, it is okay. awesome. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> Very much so. <laughs> so going into your, well, you're about to approach your first year. You've done a lot. I've seen it. Yeah. Uh, I get the newsletter. I get all that stuff. And so what, what do you, what's your next goal? What is your next like, like short-term goal that you want to achieve after your first full year? What's the next step? I think, um, aside from what we already chatted about, you know, continuing mm -hmm. the women in manufacturing, continuing our outreach to um, the talent pipeline that's coming from the ISDs and the high schools and some of the programs at LCC and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. My goal is to reach out to some of these other counties where we don't have as many members. Because if you look at Shiawassee County, it's kind of in, in the middle and up north, and they have the choice to glom on to maybe Flint or Lansing, and they didn't really know that Lansing was a choice. And if you look at Livingston County, um, they have a choice to glom on to Ann Arbor or Lansing, and they haven't really known that Lansing has been a choice for them. And so my goal is to attend as many 
um, functions and meet as many people in those two underserved counties right now as I can just to share the, mis the mission of um, our, our council with the hopes that they'll come on over and hang out with us. Awesome. Well, yeah. for those that don't happen to know you or know about your organization, what's the best way for people to connect with you? Okay, so it's CAMC, C A M C, online.org. Easiest way. Great. Well, yeah. you know what? We've come to a close, Cindy. This is great. Darn it. <laughs> I have three more hours of chatting. <laughs> well, we'll have to do that offline, everybody. Okay. So, All right. but uh, thank you for, you know, coming back on the other side of the 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 role here. I appreciate yeah. you you taking some time. Thank you for doing that. My pleasure. Thanks for uh, having me, Paul. I appreciate it. No problem. And thank you all for taking some time to listen to our program. And don't miss the next episode coming out in a couple of weeks. If there's someone you know of that you would like to hear about their journey, please email us at missioncontrol at introduce.com. And if this is your first time, please subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcasting platform. And give us a positive review. Thank you again and see you next time in the Control Center. Have a good day.